This morning's scripture is from Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. For the Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. For on that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. For the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. And at that time I will gather you. At that time. I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Well, hello, my name is Travis. I'm one of the pastors here at the village, and I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Last Sunday, we had an absolutely amazing day where we broke ground for our new facility and we had five different celebrations. I know many of you were there and uh, thank you so much for coming out to be part of this really special day. In just a minute, I'm gonna show a video, just a little highlight video for those of you who weren't able to be with us and you can just sort of see uh, some of the things that we saw out there and some of the things that we did to celebrate. Uh, speaking of celebrating and speaking of our property, uh, I want to say a huge thank you in a moment of celebration that to date, uh, through this point in the year, we've received over $550,000 toward our For the Community campaign, uh, which is funding our building and, and the, kind of the future ministry center that's going to be there on that property. And so if you've been part of that campaign, the For the Community campaign, and you've helped bring us to this point, I want to say a huge thank you to you this morning for being such a faithful part of that and for your generosity. Well, we're in week five of a series that we've been calling Undivided Heart. And, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but being undivided is not something we seem to be very good at right now. And, and as your pastor, I think I should be up front with you to tell you that that I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit concerned. I'm concerned for our country. I'm, I'm concerned for our community. I'm concerned for our church. And, and, and you don't have to look very far to see that we're divided. We're, we're divided over politics. We're divided over the reaction and the response to a global pandemic. We're divided over race and justice in the Supreme Court. We're divided over the economy. And it's not just on a big scale either, because neighbors are divided, families are divided, churches are divided, best friends are divided. And, and we started this series because in Psalm 86, King David prayed a prayer that I think we could all use to pray. And, and I often wonder what might happen if more people would pray this prayer that he prayed. He prayed, teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. Give me an undivided heart. King David was the, the greatest leader in the history of the nation of Israel, and he prayed that God would give him an undivided heart. He, he prayed for wholehearted devotion to God. The, the Bible talks a great deal about doing things with all of your heart. To be fully committed with all of your heart, it means 100% commitment. It means seeking to do what God calls you to do over and above, over and above everything else, including your, your political party, your platform, your candidate. It means evaluating the world through the lens of your faith. And in a season like this, it means evaluating your politics through your lens of faith. And so over the past few weeks, we've been looking at places where the Bible instructs the people of faith to do things with all of their heart. Uh, a few weeks ago, we read the Old Testament prophet Joel, who wrote, return to the Lord with all of your heart. Uh, we read in the book of, of Proverbs the words, trust in the Lord 
with all of your heart. Last week, we heard Jesus himself say that the most important commandment was to love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And so today's with all of your heart statement, it comes from the Old Testament prophet Zephaniah. And and when you hear it, you might begin to think that Zephaniah is out of touch with reality. But honestly, I think his story might give his his statement some more credibility. You see, Zephaniah was a a prophet in and around Jerusalem just after a man named Ammon was the king. And we we don't know a lot about Ammon other than the fact that the book of 2 Kings tells us that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He worshiped the idols that his father Manasseh had worshiped, and he did not walk in obedience to the Lord. He had an undivided heart. It was just undivided in the wrong direction. And and because of that, all across the land, you had people who practiced idolatry, which basically just means that they put other things above God. They made other things first. They put their own desires first. They put other lesser gods first. They put their own ideas about their country first. And, And then you also had people who just made up their own religion based on what they thought was good, based on based on their own ideas about about who they thought God should be but not actually based on who God was. So you had one group of people who were staunch defenders of the king. And and it didn't matter what what he said or what he did. They were on his side. It didn't matter if what he said and did were great. And it didn't matter if what he said and did were destructive. His supporters were with him 100%. And then there was another group who plotted against the king. They actually plotted against him and they assassinated him in his palace. And then it was almost like a mini civil war broke out because the supporters of the king, they rounded up and killed the ones who'd plotted against the king. And so in the time of Zephaniah, you had a lot of people rejecting God. You had a lot of people worshiping things instead of God. You had a lot of people thinking that they were worshiping God, but actually they were worshiping things other than God. You had people deeply divided. You had conspiracy theories all around. So, you know, totally nothing like today. So after Ammon was assassinated and the king's supporters killed the people who plotted against him, they put Josiah, his eight-year-old son, on the throne and they made him king. And so everything Zephaniah is speaking is into a complete and total mess. I mean, nothing seems to be going well. Nothing seems to be going right. Everything seems to be in complete turmoil. It's kind of a relatable story. And and maybe you can just relate to it right now on on a cultural scale, but but maybe it's more personal than that for you. I mean, some of us feel like Zephaniah did, and, and we're simply waiting for God to do something. We're, we're waiting for God to do something that he's promised, to intervene in our lives. And some of us are experiencing the unprecedented nature of the moment, and it's becoming more unprecedented, and, and we're experiencing the uncertainty becoming more uncertain. I mean, some of us right now, we're watching the bank account get lower and lower. Some of us are are watching and it feels like every single thing we're watching is going in the wrong direction and we're not sure what to do in the meantime. I mean, what is it that we're supposed to do while we wait for God? What are we supposed to do while we wait for God? Well, here's what Zephaniah says to the people. He says, sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. You don't know if God can even hear you? Rejoice with all your heart. You're not sure how you're you're gonna make it through to the other side of this? Rejoice with all of your heart. Everything around you and everything inside you is, is going in the wrong direction? Rejoice with all of your heart. And I kinda wanna say, wait, what? I mean, has Zephaniah lost his mind? Is he completely out of touch with reality here? Or has he figured something out that the rest of us really need to hear? Because Zephaniah is saying that even when you can't control the external factors, even even when you can't control what's happening in the culture, and, and even when you can't control what's happening around you, you can still be a person of rejoicing. And if you want to be a person of rejoicing, According to Zephaniah, you've got to press the reset button on a couple things related to rejoicing. 
The first thing is that you need to reset the reason for rejoicing because Zephaniah doesn't say, hey, be happy with all your heart if things are going well. And, and, and I think there's an important distinction, important difference between rejoicing and just being happy. You see, happiness is all about circumstances. It's all about external circumstances. I mean, things are going well, you're happy. He called you or she called you and asked you out, you're happy. You got an interview for that new job, you're happy. The market goes up, you're happy. Your candidate wins the debate or wins the election, you're happy. But, but what about when things aren't going well? What about when there's no phone call? What about when you've, you've put in the application but no one responds? What about when the market goes down or your candidate doesn't get the votes? I heard a story, uh, heard a story recently about a king who, who lived in a remote area of the world. And he, he had this friend and advisor who'd been his friend since they were kids. And then this friend went with him everywhere he went. His friend had a, he had a saying that he repeated. And no matter what happened or what was happening around them, whether it was good, whether it was bad, his friend would say, Oh, this is good. I mean, it didn't matter what it was. Oh, this is good. Oh, this is good. And so, the two of them went out on a hunting expedition and and the friend had loaded the gun and he'd gotten it all ready for the king. But, but when he loaded it, something must have gone wrong because when the king went to fire the gun, something went wrong and it misfired and it blew off his thumb. And, and his friend immediately says, oh, this is good. And the king said, no, this is not good. And, and he actually had him thrown in prison. Well, about a year later, the king was... He was hunting in an area that, that he should have known to stay clear of. And, and in that moment, he was surrounded and he was captured by a group of cannibals. And, and they took him to their village and they tied his hands and they stacked up some wood and they set up a stake and they tied him to the stake. And as they came near to set fire to the wood, they noticed that the king was missing his thumb. And they were really superstitious and they never ate anyone who was less than whole. And so they untied the king and they let him go. Well, as the king was returning home, he started to think about his friend and he started to feel remorseful. And so he went to the jail where he'd put his friend to apologize to him and, and in order to let him out. And he said, I'm so sorry for sending you to jail for so long. And his friend said, no, this is good. And the king said, what do you mean this is good? I've left you in jail for a year. And his friend said, if I hadn't been in jail, I would have been with you. <laughs> You see, when you, when you reset the reason for your rejoicing, you make a decision that external factors aren't the primary reason for your state of mind. The Apostle Paul himself, he spent a good bit of time in jail, and, and he actually had a similar mindset. He wrote several letters that are in the New Testament from jail, and, and one of those is the book of Philippians in the New Testament, and in Philippians 4, verse 4, from this dark dingy jail cell, he writes these words, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it again, rejoice. And, and the reset that Paul is pointing out here is that if you want to be a person of rejoicing, in addition to resetting the reason for your rejoicing, you've got to reset the recipient of your rejoicing. Paul says rejoice in the Lord. He, he doesn't say rejoice in your circumstances with all your heart. Now listen, sometimes our circumstances can be really great. I mean, maybe your circumstances are great right now, but circumstances can change in the blink of an eye. I mean, one phone call, one text message, one test result. And what do you do in that moment when your circumstances go from good to bad to worse to nightmarish? Paul doesn't say rejoice in your achievements with all of your heart. Now, achievement in and of itself, it's not a bad thing. I mean, some of us like to achieve. We like to win. I like to win. And maybe you've achieved something in life. Maybe you're achieving something right now. But, but achievement is temporary. And if you only rejoice in your achievement, you will eventually be disappointed because someday someone will outachieve you. That's why Paul doesn't say rejoice in your achievements. He also doesn't say rejoice in your possessions. I mean, God's not upset, I don't think, if you have cool stuff, unless you're hoarding it and, and being selfish with it and only using it for yourself, but that's probably a different message for a different day. But here's the deal, no matter how much you have, somebody always has more. And it can lead you to feel like what you have will never be enough and it will never be good enough, which is why Paul doesn't say rejoice in your possessions. 
There are a lot of things that could be the recipient of our rejoicing, but there's there's only one thing that will never let us down, which is why Paul says rejoice in the Lord with all of your heart. He talks about this in 2 Corinthians 4. When he, when he says this in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. And he says, it's written, therefore I've spoken. And and since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though we are wasting away outwardly, inwardly, we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is unseen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. See, we've got options on where we can fix our eyes. We have we have choices in terms of who or what the recipient of our rejoicing is. There are a lot of things that we can try to rejoice in, but as the book of Hebrews says, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. One of my favorite hymns is the old hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And and the story of the person who wrote it is, is this powerful story of somebody who deeply understood this. His name was Horatio Spafford. He wrote, It is well with my soul in 1873. And the first verse says, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And if you hear that hymn, it sounds like the person who wrote it must have had a life where everything was going right, that 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 must be the world's happiest person. But that's not the case. Horatio Spafford was a successful lawyer in Chicago in the middle part of the 1800s, and he and his wife, Anna, had four daughters, and they'd invested everything they had in real estate. And in October 1871, the Great Chicago Fire destroyed everything that they owned. Well, they had a friend who was going on a preaching tour in Europe, and and he invited Horatio and his family to, to meet him over there so they could take some time away from all the stress and all the loss that they'd experienced. But at the last minute, some zoning issues came up related to the fire and the rebuilding that was happening. And so he had to stay behind, but he went ahead and he sent his wife and his daughters onto the ship and he promised to meet them there shortly after after they got there. Well, on November 22nd, while that ship was crossing the Atlantic, it was struck by this large iron sailing ship And it killed 226 people on the ship, including all four of Horatio's daughters. And somehow his wife managed managed to survive. And when she made it to England, she sent him a telegraph that had two words on it, saved alone. And so he rushed and he got on the next ship that he could get on to be able to grieve with his wife. And, And it happened that that ship went over the exact spot where the wreck had happened and where the wreckage now entombed his daughters three miles under the surface. And so the captain knew that Horatio was on board and he asked him if he'd like them to stop over the spot so that so that he could pay his respects. And he said, yes. And so when they arrived at the spot where his daughters had been killed, he went and he stood on the bow of the boat and he looked down into the water. And after a few minutes, he went back to his cabin and he sat down and he penned these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when everything is going great. When sorrows like sea billows roll, when everything is out of control, whatever my lot, no matter what happens to me, good or bad, thou hast taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, not circumstantially, it is well with my soul. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly, We are being renewed day by day 
For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. I was I was reminded of that this week in a really kind of small way. Uh, last Sunday was an incredible day, breaking ground for our building and some of us getting to see each other and worship together in person for the first time in over seven months. And, and I sort of thought that once we broke ground on our building, all our troubles would go away. I mean, we break ground on the building, no more problems, right? Well, that lasted all of about 15 minutes because I came home and our washing machine broke. And it was full of water and it kept kept tricking, tripping the breaker. And, and kind of long story short, there wasn't really anything we could do about it. So we drained the water, carried it downstairs, said our goodbyes. And I went out Monday to buy a new washing machine. You know, so much for my happiness. Later in the week, Amanda and I carried the, the new washing machine upstairs and and I hooked up the water and, and I hooked up the drain pipe and I plugged it into the wall and I went to turn it on and nothing. I, I turned the knobs, I pressed the buttons, and it didn't do a thing. And, and I thought, well, I thought some thoughts, I'll just say that, and they were not rejoicing thoughts. But after a, a few moments of turning knobs and pressing buttons and thinking thoughts and getting no response, Amanda said, oh, we've got to flip the breaker back on. And I was like, I know we do. We've got to flip the breaker back on like I didn't already know that. And so I came downstairs and I flipped the breaker back on and I came back upstairs and, and boom, it came right on like I already knew it would, of course. <laughs> when I talk about rejoicing, rejoicing with all of your heart, some of us right now are like that washing machine and that light is just not coming on. And, and listen, I get it. I mean, I understand, I'm, I'm with you in the struggle. It might be hard right now to rejoice and you're not alone in that. But here's what I want you to know. Regardless of how you feel right now, God wants you to experience rejoicing. God wants you to experience joy. Not a, not a happiness based on external circumstances that, that goes away when the circumstances change, but a grace and a joy that comes from a deep connection to Jesus. One that can't be taken away from you no matter what happens. And, and I wonder if, if for some of us, maybe we're not feeling very able to rejoice right now. And maybe we're not experiencing joy right now because we're not really connected to the source of joy. I mean, I know that for me, the, the times when I have the most trouble experiencing joy are, are the times when I've somehow become disconnected from the source of joy. And that's where some of us are right now. And you've become disconnected. There's no sense of joy. It, it feels like there's a massive disconnection between you and God. And if that's you today, I wanna to pray for you. Wherever you are, if you feel like you've become disconnected from Jesus and you wanna be close to him, I wanna pray for you because I know that he is the absolute true source of rejoicing. And, and it's not until we connect deeply to Jesus that we can begin to understand what it means and what it looks like and what it feels like to rejoice with all of our hearts. So I wanna ask you right now, if you would, just close your eyes. And I wanna have a moment where we pray together and I pray for you. And I know that some of you right now, joy and rejoicing are the farthest thing from your mind. They don't even feel possible. If that's you, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that you would have a deep connection to Jesus. I want to pray that you would find a connection to the source of joy. And that because of that, your life might be changed. So let's pray together. God, it's a divided world and it's a divided time. And we don't always know what to do. We don't always know where to turn. We don't always know how to feel. And God, sometimes we hear things like rejoice. And it feels like it feels like it's just a voice out of nowhere that has no idea what it's like to be us right now. 
But God, we, we also know right now that rejoicing and joy don't come from what happens on the outside, but they come from a deep connection to you on the inside. And so God, right now, I pray for everybody who can hear the sound of my voice, that you would help us to connect deeply to you and to Jesus. God, we wanna connect to you. Fill our hearts with joy. Fill our lives with rejoicing. Help us to see Jesus more clearly. We pray these things in his name. Amen.